In many respects, the Xbox 360 hardware was a large departure from the original Xbox, not just in processing power, but the way they decided to get their parts as well. The original Xbox was comprised of an almost off-the-shelf Coppermine Pentium 3 CPU and a GeForce 3 and 4 hybrid GPU, both being extremely similar to components that were already available for PCs. On the other hand, Microsoft dabbled in a lot more custom silicon with the Xbox 360. It was comprised of novel designs like Xenon, an IBM-designed PowerPC triple-core chip with in-order execution, and Xenos, a bizarre ATI GPU that used an early iteration of their unified shader Terascale architecture. Now, these were unlike any standard PC hardware available at the time. However, that early Terascale design would eventually evolve into R600. This GPU was introduced in graphics cards that ATI did sell, namely the HD2900 series, and it got me thinking. What would a PC-based equivalent of the Xbox 360's GPU look like, and how close could it be in performance? As it turns out, there's one forgotten R600 card that may well have the answer to that. Alright, so you might be looking at this card and think, what is he doing comparing the Xbox 360's GPU to a 2900 XT? But rest assured, this is not a 2900 XT. This is the obscure 2900 GT, which has some key differences I'll be getting into. We'll start off by doing a little compare and contrast with this card in Xenos, and I will say I'm going to get into a fair amount of technical details. If that isn't your thing, then I will add chapters so you can skip ahead to the testing, but you'll be missing out on some interesting specs and reasons why these two should be compared. You may know that the full R600 in the 2900 XT has 320 stream processors, but the 2900 GT makes use of a neutered chip with one compute unit disabled, meaning that just like Xenos, we have 48 five-way shader ALUs for a total of 240 stream processors, although that's a bit of a misnomer in the case of Xenos. For R600 GT, it's 240 scalar processors, but for Xenos, it's 48 VEC4 and 48 scalar processors. My understanding is that these GPUs are laid out in different ways. R600's ALUs are five-way in that it has five discrete units with the first four referred to as the thin cores and the fifth being a more complex fat one for special functions, while Xenos's ALUs are five-way in that they can co-issue a VEC4 and scalar instruction simultaneously. The twist in R600 is that being a very long instruction word architecture, it runs five entirely independent instructions in parallel and therefore is made to take advantage of instruction level parallelism, while Xenos is not. In short, both GPUs have a similar amount of functional units that should be capable of similar things, but they process data pretty differently. The development of Xenos and R600 was said to run in parallel for some time, and this is evident in how some ideas were retained in the newer GPU. For one, Xenos's mem export feature was somewhat present in R600's stream out. This would allow the GPUs to push and pull data directly to and from the system RAM while bypassing the render backend, and in both it's definitely more of a GPGPU oriented feature. The cherry on top is that R600 retains the dedicated tessellation engine that made its debut in Xenos, although in both GPUs it saw next to no use by devs except for Viva Pinata on Xbox 360 and the Ruby Whiteout tech demo on PC. The way the chips handled anti-aliasing was quite different, and Xenos AA Resolve is performed by additional logic in the EDRAM daughter die, which was capable of doing 4x AA with a negligible performance head. On the other hand, R600's anti-aliasing hardware was seemingly not present or not functional, as it used the questionable method of doing AA on the shader hardware. ATI's copium for this was that it allowed for configurable AA filters, but this would chew away at precious shader performance and pixel throughput, and in general, R600 tends to see a large hit to performance with the feature on. Also, aside from stream processors, there are some other notable differences in the GPU config. This cutdown variant of R600 has 25% less texture fill rate per clock due to it having 12 TMUs instead of 16. However, pixel fill rate is 50% higher per clock with its 12 ROPs instead of 8. Fun fact, while both are unified shader architectures, Xenos lacks geometry shaders so it technically wouldn't be DirectX 10 compliant. It was often called a Shader Model 3.0 Plus GPU for superseding its requirements, but not quite being up to specs with 4.0. VRAM is dynamically allocated from the system RAM in Xenos, but if we were to go off of a 50-50 split, which is probably the most reasonable for a comparison like this, we need 256 megabytes of VRAM. And lucky for us, that's exactly how much this card has on board. But seeing as the 2900 GT uses a 256-bit memory bus, I downclocked the memory to 350 MHz to match the bandwidth of Xenos, which uses 700 MHz GDDR3 on a 128-bit bus. So in the end, I think we have a good recipe for an equivalent here. With its Xenos DNA, similar shader throughput on paper, and the clocks dialed in to match, this looks like the closest we can get to Xenos on PC short of that bizarre debug card that surfaced a few years ago. We're going about testing in a similar way to my original Xbox equivalent video. Today's bench suite features 12 games ranging from early to late in the Xbox 360's lifecycle, with a special focus on trying a myriad of different game engines. 
With the settings, I'll be trying to match image quality of the 360 versions as best as I can, but of course, it won't always be apples to apples due to version differences and me not having the best eye for some of the super fine details. Definitely expect a margin of error here, but I think I got most of them very close. All games were tested at the resolution they run at on 360, which is 720p for all the games we're testing. I usually try to fit as many built-in benchmarks as possible in my videos for both consistency and to make it easier for you guys to reproduce my results, but this time around I'm going to be sparing with it to ensure we're using more comparable scenes for testing. Now I won't be using anti-aliasing, even for the games that have it on 360 as like I said before, it pretty much gets its AA for free while on R600 it comes at a great cost of shader performance. Seeing as games on 360 would run virtually the same either way, I think it just makes sense to leave it off on R600 as it's guaranteed to take a large hit. This time around I use the standard PCIe testbed, and I'll quickly throw up its specs on screen. I'll talk about this a bit more later in the video, but I had to use two sets of drivers for testing, those being Catalyst 11.2 for the older games and 13.9 for some of the newer ones. All game footage was captured from the 2900 GT's DVI output, and with that, I think it's finally about time. Break out your Xbox 360 controllers and wireless receivers, because we're going to dig into some testing. Starting off the early games is Fear, and this was one game where I used the built-in benchmark for consistency. I found a mix of max and medium settings with no soft shadows to be very comparable, and our down-tuned 2900 GT averaged an impressive 90 frames per second. Frame times were a bit rocky in some sections, but this is typical for Fear's benchmark. The 360 runs this game at 30 frames per second with some dips into the 20s, so we're well above our target. I would speculate the early games are like this because the developers were still figuring out how to make full use of the hardware, and as such, some performance is left on the table. That or 60 FPS was ruled out since any stutters would become much more noticeable at higher frame rate. Either way, things are looking a bit too good for this card, but the standings will change the newer the games are, as you'll see here in a bit. Next up is the Elder Scrolls Oblivion. Here I use the high preset with HDR. For the bench I measured a 60 second run of a settlement area, and the card put down 67 frames per second on average. Some moderate stutters were felt throughout the entire run. It makes the average feel a little bit slower than it is, but it was never a pace breaker during gameplay. Our target for this game is the same 30 FPS with some dips, and at this mark I'd say it passes thanks to the frame rate being high enough to offset those stutters. Now it's on to the debut of a series that became synonymous with Xbox, the original Gears of War. I tested 60 seconds of gameplay from the first level to get my numbers and used the high settings throughout. We hit a nice 60 frames per second, there were some minor swings felt in some segments and a rather large stutter above 100 milliseconds that was repeatable, but it only happened once in the run. We're still well above the 360 in raw averages here, but again any dips were much more noticeable on PC due to this. These older games might really benefit from a 30fps cap and they would feel exactly like the 360, but I did want to see the full performance of this card. Let's move on to some games coming from around the middle of the 360 lifespan, and we've got a system killer with Grand Theft Auto 4. Medium settings seemed to be the closest in image quality, and draw distances were set to these values which were apparently confirmed to be console equivalent by Rockstar themselves. In game they looked the part, so I believe it. The card cranks out 31 frames per second on average, but as is typically the case with the PC version of this game, the frame times were absolutely atrocious, with huge swings happening pretty much all the time. Unfortunately, the game is unplayable like this. The 360 runs it at an uncapped frame rate with around 30 FPS most of the time with drops into the teens, but the huge constant stutter is absent on console. Due to the horrendous optimization of the PC port, this is the first L for the GPU equivalent. Our first Ubisoft title is Far Cry 2, and we're testing with the high preset, HDR, and DX9 mode. In the 50 second ranch small benchmark, we got a decent 37 frames per second. There were a few moderate stutters to note, but the rest look really stable. This was definitely a close one. The 2900 GT is getting slightly higher average frame rates with a bit of stutter, but keep in mind the 360 can have some dips as well, so I think we're at least matching it here. We've got Mirror's Edge up next. I selected the high preset and benched 60 seconds of gameplay on the first level, including some brief combat sections. Here the card built up some courage, averaging 41 frames per second, with very respectable frame times to match. I wasn't expecting this out of the 2900 GT, and with our target being a relatively consistent 30 FPS, it's a close one, but the GPU equivalent actually has the definitive edge here. Now on to Just Cause 2. I tested 45 seconds of gameplay in a fairly intensive scene of the first level. Medium settings were chosen and the rest is shown here. With this we got 40 frames per second on average. There were minor swings throughout the run and occasional larger stutter, but the amount of larger spikes varied each run with some not as bad as others. 
I'd call this matchup a tie as the averages are well above the 30 FPS you'll get on 360, but the frame times were noticeably less consistent. Can it run Crisis 2? Here's a little tidbit. Originally I was going to use the OG Crisis for testing, but the console ports don't actually use the same game engine on PC as it happens. Instead of CryEngine 2, they use the newer CryEngine 3 due to its better performance. On the other hand, Crisis 2 uses the newer engine for both PC and console, so it was automatically what I went for in the comparison. Crytek themselves said that the high preset was for the most part what consoles run it at, so we're using that along with 60 seconds of gameplay in the first level for testing. The 2900 GT manages 26 frames per second, but there was a lot of frame rate variance and it felt more like the high teens. The game is kinda playable like this, but it, it pales in comparison to the smoother 30 FPS you'll get on 360. Metal Gear Rising is a fun oddball of its series. We're testing it with the medium settings and a minute of hacking up enemies. I also switched to the 13.9 drivers for this point going forward as I had some issues using 11.2 in some of these newer games. The card averaged 31 frames per second with noticeable amount of variance during gameplay, but it didn't detract from the experience too badly. It's definitely playable, but this frame rate isn't exactly ideal for a faster paced game like this. This is one of those 360 games that runs at 60 FPS and does so with some drops into the mid 40s, putting the 2900 GT pretty far behind here. Now we've got the Tomb Raider reboot, and I tested this game with the normal preset and measured a quick run with some combat in the forest. We scored 22 frames per second on average, and to my surprise the frame times were extremely good aside from some moderate swings here and there. It's a good effort from the 2900 GT, but isn't quite matching up with the stable 30 FPS you'll get on the Xbox. Getting into the games from 2014 and beyond is our second to last title, Dark Souls 2. I'm testing with the medium settings throughout with low shadows and no AF. In some brief combat scenes we scored 42 frames per second on average, and this stayed tight aside from some larger but infrequent spikes during the run. Except for some extra stutters, performance is actually matching up really close with the 360 here, which runs the game uncapped getting around 30 to 40 FPS most of the time. Because we gotta have at least one car game, the newest and final game we're testing is Grid Autosport, and I selected the medium preset and used 2.5 minutes of the built-in benchmark for consistency. The card put out 36 frames per second, but it wasn't that consistent with pretty frequent frame time spikes. It wasn't enough to take me out of the game too much, but it also didn't feel like 36 FPS. The frame times have me ranking this one below the 360, but I will say I was very impressed that a game this recent managed to be playable at all with these settings. Gotta hand it to Codemasters for their optimization. Considering we don't have the benefit of console optimizations, I think the 2900 GT did a pretty good job of recreating the Xbox 360's performance overall. In 7 out of 12 games, it was able to meet or exceed the console, and I was rather surprised in the later games especially, where developers likely had to pull a lot more strings to get the games to work well on the aging system. Now of course, the card wasn't without its issues. Some losses it took could be pretty harsh like in GTA 4 and Metal Gear Rising, and goes to show that for one reason or another, not every game is going to be a perfect match. You have to remember that on the 360, devs could squeeze every bit of performance and features out of the hardware since it's invariable, and they don't have the limits of accounting for dozens of potential configs and feature sets when programming their game. On another note, originally I was going to include some more of the later 360 games like Battlefield 3 or Dragon Age Inquisition, but it seems like DICE really had a thing against the HD 2000 series. For whatever reason, their DirectX 10.1 only on ATI hardware, meaning only the HD 3000 series and up can run them. Assassin's Creed Black Flag was another game that I ended up scrapping, H blank fit at best. I couldn't actually match image quality to the 360 version, and even if I could, we were getting frame rates in the low teens. In addition, I'm sure a lot of you are aware of the bleak driver situation with early Terrascale. I mean, I had to use two sets of drivers in order to get all the games to work well here, and it's always going to be something of a struggle with these cards. In the end, is this card exactly like Xenos in every aspect? Definitely not, but if there were to be a normal PC graphics card parallel to it, then I think you couldn't get much closer. In many respects, Xenos was a sort of proto R600 GPU, and this really shows in all the things that they share in common. 
the five-way shader units, the tessellation engine, the memory export. That stuff didn't just come out of nowhere and shows that for R600, ATI built upon the 360 GPU's foundations with the goal of tailoring it to the PC role as well. That about does it for this comparison. The 2900 GT isn't a flawless equivalent to Xenos, but it is an equivalent, which is more than a lot of other graphics cards can say. A special thanks goes out to the first R580 tier Patreon supporter, Pharaoh said. Thank you guys very much for all of the support.